Hey everyone, Anarch here, and this is sort of a new kind of video on the channel. That is to say, I'm going to be doing a response to another YouTuber's video. That is, Second Thoughts Video Authoritarianism. Now, generally, I don't do response videos to other YouTubers. Uh, I definitely don't want to get into that like debate niche. Uh, I don't want to uh, have a channel based around drama baiting. However, I've had numerous people reach out to me who I really respect, who thought that it was a good idea for me to do a response to this video. Second Thought has a very large platform and a lot of people probably saw that video. So I went and I watched it and what I found was it really didn't form a substantive rebuttal to any of the critiques of anarchists or libertarian socialists. In a very real way, it kind of just represented a repetition of Engels' essay on authority. In fact, as we'll see, on authority is cited directly. Um, before I continue, I also want to clarify that this is not a video of me attacking second thought. In a general sense, I don't really um, have a problem with Second Thought as a person, and honestly, most of his videos are at least informative. I think they generally steer people in the right direction, even if I disagree with him sometimes. So don't take this as uh, uh, me trying to debunk uh, Second Thought as a person. You can kind of take these arguments and apply them as you like across his material and decide for yourself whether they're good critiques. I'm going to lay out the anarchist conception of authoritarianism, and I think after you hear the way that it's been described, you'll understand exactly what the anarchist critique is, and you'll understand why even after Engels published On Authority, it really didn't change anything about the anarchist critique, nor did it change anything about the anarchist conception of how a revolution should be done. So. Let's get started actually looking at Second Thought's video. I suppose I need to make the preface here that go watch Second Thought's video. It's not that long, so it's really not that much effort to go watch. And I hope you'll see that I'm not really cherry picking or taking Second Thought out of context here, but we're not gonna watch the entire video together. I'm going to choose specific segments and we're gonna talk about those segments. And then at certain points, I'll give counterpoints so you can understand the anarchist perspective on these topics. The first is Second Thought's conception of authoritarianism. Authoritarianism favoring or enforcing strict obedience to authority, especially that of the government, at the expense of personal freedom. Okay, this is a pretty bad definition if we're being honest. It mentions the government in there, but doesn't really commit to being political, just kinda, uh, when you want people to follow the rules. That's not super helpful when we're trying to nail down a heavily used term, and one that deals with some serious topics. So the definition that Second Thought starts us out with here is a dictionary definition. And I'd like to note that it's always a bad idea to start a discussion about politics or political theory in general with a dictionary definition. I think this is a common mistake that people can make. You know, dictionary definitions talk about common usages. However, when we're talking about political theory, we're talking about ideas wherein we need high degrees of specificity and detail. Also, Political theory has so many different thinkers within it that we also need to be regarding which definition we are actually using, right? Political theory, like a lot of academic topics, it uses words in ways which are not common usage. And what that means is we also have to be clear, you know, whose usage of authoritarianism are we using here? Uh, however, I will at least concede that Second Thought's probably not trying to go in on that quite yet. Second Thought is, is pointing out to us here how um, authoritarianism, or this, this word authoritarian, is kind of nebulous in its usage in a lot of contexts. So before we continue, I just want to be absolutely clear what I mean by authoritarianism. When I say authoritarianism, and this is uh, generally the case when you see this word authoritarianism being used across the, the anarchist or libertarian socialist literature, we're talking about the degree to which some power structure monopolizes the flow of power within an organization. And this is important because 
yes, this corresponds heavily to the concept of centralization, but it's not exactly synonymous with the concept of centralization, right? You could have a few different sites of power and each of them serve to monopolize the power that would generally be controlled by the people, which roots from the people. But instead, the way that that power is dictated and determined, the way it flows, takes place by a very small number of power holders. And moreover, it is monopolized by those power holders. However, I also want to be clear that the definition of authoritarianism that I'm using here, it leaves out a component that is often present when you look at anarchist and libertarian socialist theory, and that is this concept of domination. Domination is the degree to which some power structure utilizes coercion, violence, and deception in order to maintain itself. Usually, anarchists and libertarian socialists, they just sort of um, fold domination into authoritarianism, right? They sort of include them together. And this is because, in a general sense, authoritarianism corresponds with domination. Where you monopolize power, you're going to find that that monopolization of power is going to tend to catalyze itself with coercion, violence, and deception, and as we continue forward, I just want to note, he never really addresses this conception of authoritarianism. Uh, the closest he's ever going to get is when he refers to on authority by Engels, but we'll address that as we proceed. So starting here, what Second Thought does is he starts giving examples of what most people think of when they think of authoritarianism. Well, if you have a scroll through the comments of just about any political video that talks about socialism, you'll find people ready with their pre-written list of objections, usually bundled under the prime objection, that's authoritarian. Things on that list include the existence of large prisons or labor camps, a covert police force, state media, a strongman leader, censorship, that sort of thing. These examples actually are examples of authoritarianism. However, they are examples of authoritarianism when you recognize what the meaning of authoritarianism is. They all exist through monopolization of some flow of power by a small body of holders, and they utilize violence, coercion, and deception at their core. So here, Second Thought kind of lays out a summary of what he's going to do in the video. Here's what we're going to do for the rest of the video. First, we'll look at the list of objections as understood by liberals. And I mean that in the broadest sense, liberals as in subjects of liberal states, not in the conservative versus liberal sense. Then we'll look at those same objections as understood by the left. Again, pretty broadly speaking. Basically everyone from social democrats and beyond. Then finally, we'll consider a better way to understand authority and authoritarianism. Sound good? So he starts with the liberals and I think there's some validity to what he's pointing out here, which is that liberals like to talk a lot about uh, authoritarianism as it occurs in, in state capitalist nations like the USSR or China or North Korea. But almost all of those features exist within places like the United States or the UK or many places in Europe. In fact, sometimes to a much worse degree. So actually, I think Second Thought is correct to make this critique, but I do think that all it really boils down to is what's called an argument from hypocrisy. As an example of the argument from hypocrisy, it might be that, uh, you know, you find somebody murdering somebody, you know, they, they've just finished killing someone or murdering them. And, you know, you say, whoa, you can't do that. You know, murder is wrong. And they say, well, you know, you just murdered somebody last week. Murder didn't become okay because the person who was accusing them of it committed the same crime last week, right? It doesn't matter who does it. It's not good. The argument from hypocrisy is fallacious. That is to say, it doesn't really matter if the opponent is doing it as well. It doesn't become okay as soon as the opponent is doing it. So it's not valid to say that liberal democracies are also authoritarian. 
it doesn't really serve in any way to address the concerns of uh, people who are concerned with authoritarianism broadly. It doesn't it doesn't uh, really address the concerns of anarchists or libertarian socialists when they talk about the concept of authoritarianism, as had been discussed previously. We can see that this concept of authoritarianism, which I set up just a minute ago, is actually still valid in all of these examples, right? Yes, they're occurring in liberal democracies. That's because liberal democracies are also authoritarian. Also, in this section, Second Thought points out that uh, a lot of this distortion arises because of Red Scare propaganda, uh, or more appropriately, you know, the propaganda of uh, Western capitalist nations against places like the USSR and China and so on. You know, I, I'll just concede openly that that's absolutely the case. That, that, that is 100% true. And a lot of people's distorted perceptions of what's taken place in all of these projects is 100% because of uh, Western propaganda. Another thing I want to note is that he spends 10 minutes giving examples of how liberal democracies are also authoritarian, or what I would say is a traditional bourgeois democracies are also authoritarian. You know, that's, that's a lot of the runtime of this video. Uh, we might want to take that as some indication that this video was not really meant for leftists, that it was more meant for liberals to watch, but... The video really emphasizes later on uh, work by uh, Engels, you know, on authority. And this work was not written to liberals, you know. So the video kind of has a little bit of a scatterbrained approach. It doesn't seem to quite know who its intended audience is. And I think what it's really trying to do as, as a net here is it's trying to convince everyone that authoritarianism doesn't exist and that it's not a problem even if it does exist. So here we begin the leftist section, as he calls it. We're about 15 minutes through the video by the time we get to it. And this is really where the problems of the video compound. You know, most of the criticisms that he was making about liberals were absolutely true. And liberals have this extreme blind spot in a general sense about how authoritarian that the very systems they propose actually are. However, here, I think he begins to expose that he really does not have any understanding of the leftist conception uh, of authoritarianism and what the actual critiques are to begin with. He also, starting from here, does a huge amount of apologia for state capitalism and for authoritarianism in a general sense for solving problems. Okay, that's the liberal part taken care of. Now it's time to have a little chat with my friends on the Western left. The right does a very good job at presenting a unified front. The capitalist class and the forces of reaction are incredibly powerful in the imperial core. The left is already on the back foot, and we have been for many, many years. This is why it's frankly absurd how much infighting goes on among the left. Here we can see that Second Thought considers um, any sort of a criticism of authoritarian systems as being an example of like leftist infighting, as he calls it. He says that we need to provide a unified front against the capitalists. And this is an, a very old talking point for authoritarians. And this is because authoritarians want everyone to march behind them right? They want to create a unified constituency, which essentially acts as a big labor army that they can then exploit when they create their states. Their states are then essentially going to do capitalism, and they are going to justify why they're doing capitalism as that it is uh, somehow in one way or another necessary. And that is the majority of what we see in this section. Second thought is really just arguing every single thing that's been done by state socialism is absolutely necessary and that we should all just follow behind it because we need to have a unified front. I think another thing that really annoys me about this section is that he continually says that this anti-authoritarian impulse that, you know, anarchism or libertarian socialism, that these are Western impulses and that this only really exists in the West. 
And I think this is one of the most deceptive talking points in the entire video. I think it's the one that he should be walking back the most. It really serves to erase enormous numbers of people who have struggled as anarchists and, and for libertarian socialism across the planet who weren't in the West. Another thing that annoys me here is that he continues to claim that authoritarianism only gets applied as a label to quote unquote successful projects. Funnily enough, the label authoritarian is only ever applied to successful socialist projects. The ones that failed were somehow more pure. But the moment a new system takes steps to ensure the security of their people and their new project, they're labeled authoritarian. But he doesn't really tell us what success is. And that's really one of the big problems here is that anarchists and libertarian socialists don't consider it success to just create capitalism again, right? We're not trying to carry out a revolution and then just have capitalism. That's not success in the minds of revolutionaries. That's only success if you're a sort of a militant reformist. And in every example that he's citing here, they're all capitalist. Most of them are state capitalist, which is to say the state becomes the new bourgeois. But in all of the examples, they're capitalist. There are no non-capitalist examples he gives. So what he considers success is essentially what has been said to be many times as red capitalism, right? He just wants capitalism with a coat of red paint, and he considers that successful. What he's doing with that is he is erasing the existence of projects that the people he is critiquing do consider successful and they don't consider authoritarian. So examples might be Rojava, which is the Kurdish National Liberation Movement taking place in northeast Syria. The Zapatistas, which is a national liberation movement taking place in the Chiapas district of Mexico. And historically, there are examples such as the CNT FAI during the Spanish Civil War and the Free Territories of Ukraine, which took place right after the October Revolution in Russia, the existence of the Shinmin Commune. These were all successful in the sense that they made progress towards socialism or communism, which is the goal of anarchists and libertarian socialists. So... What he's doing is he's categorically creating an equivalence between success and establishing state capitalism. And at the same time, he's erasing all examples of success that don't exactly fit that conception, which is very insulting if it's not ignorant. That is to say, either he is insulting all of these projects, he's discounting them, or he just doesn't know about them, in which case it doesn't speak well to his knowledge of left theory and history and the real existence of a revolutionary impulse throughout history. I think part of this is that there's a lack of understanding among Western self-professed leftists regarding what it actually takes to change the status quo across an entire country. Every revolution, including bourgeois revolutions like the American one, are authoritarian by default. This claim that you need authoritarian methods to succeed both falls flat on its face because he's not really engaging with an academic conception of the word authoritarianism, nor the uh, usage of this word among leftists who, is, who he is supposedly trying to speak to here, but also because, once again, he sort of just created this uh, equality between something succeeding and something establishing, reestablishing capitalism which is all that's ever happened in any of the examples he could point to. The USSR, China, North Korea, Cuba, Venezuela, any of these examples just became capitalism within very, very short order. So here we see that he just basically thinks that the authoritarian method is the only one that works. And he basically seems to be implying that anybody that is not an authoritarian, any project that has not used authoritarian methods, whether it continues to exist to this day or not, is just an invalid attempt. That uh, anybody who's not using the method that he advocates, that they're sort of like childish and ignorant. But I think the worst part about this is that he actually seems to have no idea these things exist, right? And... That's really weird because a lot of these are very public projects. You know, the Zapatistas and Rojava are extremely well known. So 
what is he talking about? You know, what, what does he think that anarchists and libertarian socialists actually want? So now he's claiming every revolution is authoritarian. And this is pretty obvious setup for what's about to come. To understand the nature of revolution a little better, let's go back to the man himself. No, no, the other one, his sugar daddy. There we go, Friedrich Engels. This large beard wrote a brilliant little piece called On Authority. It's like a page long. None of you have any excuse not to read it. It's linked below. But here's the part that I think is most applicable to this video. Have these gentlemen ever seen a revolution? A revolution is certainly the most authoritarian thing there is. It is the act whereby one part of the population imposes its will upon the other part by means of rifles, bayonets, and cannon. Authoritarian means, if such there be at all. And if the victorious party does not want to have fought in vain, it must maintain this rule by means of the terror which its arms inspire in the reactionists. Would the Paris Commune have lasted a single day if it had not made use of this authority of the armed people against the bourgeois? Should we not, on the contrary, reproach it for not having used it freely enough? Therefore, either one of two things. Either the anti-authoritarians don't know what they're talking about, in which case they are creating nothing but confusion, or they do know, and in that case they are betraying the movement of the proletariat. In either case, they serve the reaction. And here's what we've been waiting for the entire time, because his entire erroneous understanding of authoritarianism actually comes from a really bad essay written by Engels called On Authority. This essay has essentially served as a thought terminating cliche for the authoritarian left ever since Engels published it. It's essentially an excuse for them to do absolutely no structural analysis of how power functions. If a mass of people decide they're done with the current oppressive system, rise up, build something new, and then fail to protect the gains they've made, their project will be destroyed. We've seen it many times throughout history. The reactionary elements in society won't go away. So he really focuses in on Engels' quote about revolution and the use of force as being authoritarian. However, as I already defined authoritarian, which was, which was earlier in the video, this really doesn't land at all. And it didn't land when Engels made the critique either, because nobody was talking about uh, the use of revolutionary violence being authoritarianism. That's, that's always been an invalid thing to point out. You know, is a slave rising up and overthrowing their master, is that authoritarian? You know, is a woman trying to escape her abusive husband or, or uh, defending herself against her abusive husband? Is that authoritarian? You know, th this doesn't really make any sense whatsoever. And that's because this concept of authority that Engels is trying to critique is a phantom. It's, it's made up. He's basically critiquing no one. It's a straw man. Nobody ever conceived that there would not be any need for force or violence. So let's talk about the contraposition to the concepts of authoritarianism and domination. First, the opposite of authoritarianism is libertarianism. Libertarianism is the degree to which the flow of social power is socially distributed. Once again, you may notice this has some correlation to decentralization, but it's not an exact analog to decentralization. The second opposite here is what is called mutuality. And mutuality is the degree to which some power structure uses cooperation, self-defense, and free thought to establish itself. Authoritarians always fail to understand that these are the opposites of what they are advocating, right? It's not as if there is no alternative, which second thought kind of seems to uh, present the idea that there's just like no alternative, but there is an alternative and these are those alternatives. I think the key one here to notice, however, is self-defense. Notice that when we conceive that the opposite of domination includes the stipulation of self-defense, 
The examples that were given just a minute ago about the uh, slave overthrowing the slave master and the woman, the battered wife trying to escape their abuser. These things all at once like make sense, right? We don't have to like weirdly try to refer to these as being authoritarian. These are obvious impulses of self-defense. They're examples of the opposite of authoritarianism. And that's really, truly the thesis that takes apart this entire video and Engel's essay and every argument that has been made by authoritarians for a very long time. And that is, the alternative is that we are trying to distribute power to the people. And the way that that's done is by empowering people to defend themselves and to dissolve the centralization of power, to dissolve the monopolization of power in the hands of very few people. Those two principles that were just noted there of libertarianism and mutuality, these are the principles which prevent the establishment of authoritarianism and domination. Therefore, these are the impulses which prevent counter-revolution. Insofar is that some project carries that out, that it, that it uh, devolves power back to the people and that it allows the people to defend themselves, then it is, in fact, the most anti-authoritarian act that can be carried out. Revolution is, by its very nature, anti-authoritarian. Or, it's not revolution. It's just the reproduction of the old system. And that's precisely why the authoritarians always produce the old system again. These things may not be morally correct, but like it or not, they are necessary. And that's something that every system has agreed on. Because they cannot discern actual structural differences between different kinds of power structures. And they don't seem to be able to understand how this distribution of power can differ between different kinds of power structures. Because they can't apparently discern the difference between aggressive violence and self-defense of the people. That's why they can't actually pull off a successful revolution. All they seem to be able to do is do bourgeois revolutions. We've seen what the people in Tsarist Russia had to do. We've seen what the Cubans had to do. We've seen what the Vietnamese had to do. What the Chinese had to do. What the Americans had to do to separate from the British. And, of course, a bourgeois revolution is preferable to being under, for example, feudalism, which Every example that they will point out to you of a quote unquote successful revolution was literally just a transition between uh, feudalism or mercantilism and capitalism. So they literally have only ever transitioned to capitalism. The only ideological stances, the only revolutionary activity that has ever produced any movement towards socialism or communism are anarchist and libertarian socialist movements. So here, Second Thought gives an example of why authoritarianism is necessary in Chile. Second Thought seems to imply here that if Chile had done things more like Cuba, for example, or China or the USSR, that it wouldn't have been cooed. However, there's really no reason to believe that. There's no exact detail where if they had done things like the USSR or like China, that those events would not have taken place. In fact, we have plenty of examples of authoritarian left projects where they had all of those features and yet they were still successfully cooed by a foreign government. So it seems to me that all Second Thought is really doing here is pointing out Chile was cooed and that's because it wasn't authoritarian enough. But he doesn't provide any reason for us to believe that that's the case. Chile had a state army. Chile had police. Chile had prisons. Chile had uh, all of the things that Second Thought is essentially arguing are necessary, except for, he's saying, a, a sort of secret police or an intelligence agency. However, I haven't really seen if that's the case or not. Uh, it sure seems as if in the accounts that I've read, Chile had pretty prolific control over the entire economy and who was appointed to what positions all the way down to the workplace. So clearly the problem in Chile was not lack of central control. I think that this is just uh, begging the question. So here we see that Second Thought basically thinks that no alternatives are possible. I would love nothing more than to see an alternative work, but it never has. Maybe one day I'll be proven wrong. That would be amazing. But to the people who believe it is possible, 
you need to ask yourself how it's going to happen. However, once again, there already are alternatives. Like there already have been alternatives utilizing libertarianism and mutuality. Um, in fact, they exist as we speak and they are very operative within our movements. And they're also very operative in polities that have hundreds of thousands or even millions of people inside of them. Uh, that is to say the Zapatistas and Rojava. And historically, we also have the example of CNT FAI and the free territories, both of which had prolific alternatives. But let's actually talk about what those alternatives are. It's easy for me to say like they exist. The alternatives are that power roots from the bottom. I think this is very important to understand. Power can be delegated, but it has to be able to be instantly recalled and dissolved. That is to say, you start with the bottom most unit, you know, say it is a community council in the example of governance, say it is a militia in the form of something that would be an alternative to the army, say it would be a, um, a pod in the in the alternative to the intelligence agencies. And then what you do is you have these make decisions from the bottom up about what kinds of structures will exist. And then these, you will have them delegate that power and it's temporary and it's revocable because that's the most important part. Okay. It might be that particular functions are necessary, but the question is, if people find that those in power are abusing that power, can they simply revoke the structure of that power and then build alternatives? Because here's what we've seen. Confederations of militias work. In fact, guerrilla insurgencies almost always use confederations of militias. Okay. In fact, today, Rojava uses confederations of militias, and it is a highly successful military structure. What the authoritarian seems to be missing is that in authoritarianism, power and decision-making roots from the top. The top makes decisions, and those are imposed downwards. And at the very bottom, you don't get to make decisions about what the top does or what the, what the top can or cannot do. In libertarianism, which is the opposite of authoritarianism, power always roots to the bottom. If somebody above them in some sort of delegated structure is not doing what they want, they can dissolve the entire structure. This is the difference between the two methods. Where does power root to when it is revoked? In authoritarianism, it roots to the top. In libertarianism, it roots to the bottom. I should also say, if you're interested in knowing more specific formulations of how this takes place, obviously you can look into the real life examples, such as those who have been listed, uh, Rojava, the Zapatistas, the CNT FAI in the Spanish Civil War, and the Free Territories of Ukraine. Those are all good ones to research. But I've also kind of laid this out in my videos, Constructing the Revolution and After the Revolution. I think another thing that's unusual is that second thought keeps giving examples wherein people rose up without central authoritarian coordination. And that is how the examples he gave took place. You know, the Russian revolution did not take place because the Bolsheviks commanded everyone to do everything. In fact, the Bolsheviks kind of jumped into the driver's seat afterwards. It happened because there was a bottom up movement, confederations of different kinds of uh, horizontal and non horizontal structures from the bottom up, making decisions, acting together with coordination to get things done. Like, that is how revolutions actually take place. It's rarely the case that you have some central entity that is dictating from above the revolution. In fact, it's generally that that central entity arises after the revolution has already taken place and when the people have done all the work and then it proceeds to jump into the driver's seat and to uh, take control of the revolution afterwards and then, and then claim retroactively that it's the reason why the revolution was able to take place. Your anti-authoritarianism, while I genuinely believe it comes from a good place, is handing an easy victory to the capitalist regime. They want you to play by their rules. It's their game. You play by their rules, you lose. End of story. Another thing we see in this section, which I think is so weird, is that he seems to be acting like people who are against authoritarianism are against defensive violence. But 
in all of the examples I've given, they're using defensive violence. Authoritarians are not against violence. The only reason anybody would think that is if they falsely understood Engels' conception of authoritarianism, which has no correlation to anybody's usage of authoritarianism. And therefore, they think that somehow the anti-authoritarians are like pacifists. I just don't understand. Like, where are these anti-authoritarian pacifists you're talking about? Like, all of the examples of, of anarchist revolutions and libertarian socialist revolutions are all revolutions that utilized revolutionary violence. So it's clearly not the case that anti-authoritarians are against the use of defensive violence. There must be more to their critique than you seem to be understanding. One final thing that's important to note is that this anti-authoritarian stance is very much a Western thing. And I think the reason for that is that we here in the Imperial Corps are in a very privileged position. We can hold these naive beliefs because we don't have any skin in the game. We're not the ones under the boot. We're not the ones whose resources are being extracted, or whose homes are being bombed, or whose cities are being occupied by armed invaders in the name of freedom and democracy. We have the luxury of condemning others because we've never been on the receiving end. Think for just a moment what it would be like if your neighborhood was occupied by a foreign military force doing unspeakable things to your friends and loved ones, taking your belongings, burning homes, torturing people in the name of national security. What means would you resort to in that situation? So he keeps repeating this falsehood that uh, anarchism or anti-authoritarianism is a Western phenomena. And, uh, you know, most of the video, I've had um, a pretty charitable interpretation here. I think maybe he just doesn't know what he's talking about. But I think that the worrisome thing here is that he appears to be just like claiming this as if it's fact. He's erasing enormous numbers of people who have struggled and have not struggled in the way that he's claiming. He seems to be trying to, for example, the Zapatistas are in Mexico, Rojava is in Syria. The CNT FAI was in Spain during the Civil War. The free territories of Ukraine were in Ukraine. You know, like, none of these places were like, you know, pampered, you know, bourgeois liberal democracies. These were all places in the middle of active conflicts, and they didn't choose your methods. They didn't choose your methods, but they're being erased. You're just, you're just pretending they don't exist. And... This is just a statement of ignorance, and if it's not ignorance, it's malice. And I should also note, these are not short-term examples. You know, the, the Zapatistas have existed since 1994. That, that is a very long existence. They have been around for a long time now, and they are not doing things like you are proposing that they do. And they are not getting more authoritarian as time goes on. And they have a polity, as I understand it, of between 200,000 to 300,000 people. So it is clearly not necessary that we do things the way that you are suggesting. Rojava has existed since 2013, and they have a polity between two to three million people. It is an extremely large-scale project, and it is mostly taking place through confederations of council structures, and their military is one of the most confederated militaries on Earth. It is highly successful, and it's the big reason why ISIS no longer exists in Northeast Syria. So yeah, in summary... This was not a good video. It was essentially a regurgitation of all of the same talking points that authoritarian leftists always make. And it really highlights that they don't understand how power works. They don't understand the differences between how different power structures are constituted and how they move power around. Authoritarians always want to obscure the use of words that explain what they are. You'll notice that, for example, and this is not to make the comparison, but fascists don't want us to be able to use the word fascist. Notice that everywhere you use the word fascist, fascists come into the comments to tell you, oh, it's not fascism, you know, like you just call everything fascist, right? Because they don't want that word to be operative. They want us to have no word to refer to what they are. The same thing is happening with authoritarian leftists. They want us to not have a word to describe the sorts of power structure that they want to create. 
They, they want us to then therefore have to play on this sort of a, a rhetorical field that is impoverished of, of, of specified political terms to refer to how different political structures might work. So unfortunately, what I have to say is this is just another example of an authoritarian leftist not really engaging with the arguments of anarchists or libertarian socialists. This has zero substantive engagement with the body of theory. It really is just a propaganda piece. And when I watch it, I can only come away with the assumption that Second Thought knows that. I have to assume that Second Thought knows that anarchists and libertarian socialists have been fighting revolutionary wars since the late 1800s and early 1900s. Like, this video really seems to me like it was just created in order to further perpetuate this uh, obfuscation of what's going on. And that's disappointing. Um, I was hoping for something better. I was hoping to finally see somewhere where an authoritarian leftist actually substantively engaged with the topic at hand. However, at this point, I've come to the conclusion they don't engage with the topic at hand because they can't. If they engaged with the topic at hand, they would actually be forced to talk about the way that power structures are constructed. They would actually be forced to talk about actual form and substance. Like, why does power function this way? How could it function otherwise? And what kind of outcomes would that have? They don't even want to start that conversation. Instead, they're digging up a really crappy essay from the late 1800s, which was, might I add, refuted by Bakunin the year before it was published. So, yeah, we're just going to end it there for today. Second thought, if you're watching this, just know that I'm totally open to a conversation. If you want to do a response video, I certainly won't be upset. And uh, for anybody else watching, go over and watch Second Thoughts video if you have any doubts that I've misrepresented him here. Um, that's about it. If you like the video, click like. If you have any thoughts or comments, go down into the comments below and uh, tell me what you think. And if you've been served up numerous videos and, uh, you know, this is like the second or third time that you've had a video from my channel given to you, go over and uh, click subscribe. Lastly, if you value the work that I'm doing here on this channel, go over to my Patreon at patreon.com slash anarch and uh, become a patron for like $2, $5, $7, $10, $20, whatever. It's, it's up to you. Anyway, this has been a long one, so I think we're going to recall it there. Y'all have a good one.